My name is Hillary. This is Sabrina, and this is Nicole. And we're going to talk a little bit about A/B testing uh, with SciPy, assuming she cooperates. Yeah, I know it's really sad that some people don't know how to do A/B testing. Okay, we're going to give you a break. <laughs> Not a lot of work, 
that it's great to run an A-B test. But if you had to put tons and tons of work in to build your new feature, you're not going to be willing to have the results that, hey, this thing you put tons of work into doesn't work, doesn't, doesn't have the results you want. And so you're going to have this problem. There's all this institutional momentum behind version B. And so your results don't really matter. So what you generally want to do is have your variant in that case be something that you can put them on. So a good example of this is rather than testing out the new feature, test out some sort of proxy for it. So maybe what, it, what you want to do instead, um, so for instance, I, I worked on an A-B test once where people were considering um, having a new offering for, for a product. Um, it was, I believe it was an educational product and they wanted to have quizzes at the end. And so what they did for the A-B test was rather than actually building out the whole quizzes product, which would have taken a really long time, they had a pop-up at the end that said, uh, would you be interested in taking a quiz? And they had, in the very beginning, it was a different pop-up that had some other message. And they saw how likely people were to click on it. And so in that case, you didn't have to put a ton of effort in, so it was much easier to run the A-B test when you actually were open to seeing the results. Um, and then finally, this is another one that's um, not entirely totally obvious, is you shouldn't A-B test if there is some risk of harm to your users and customers. Um, so this was actually a real situation I was in. I was working on an educational product that was homework for students. And they had two different algorithms that would actually change the homework that was assigned to different students. And they wanted to A-B test it within a single classroom. That is an ethical no-no because it means that you could have some kids receiving a harder homework assignment than others, and that could actually hurt their grade. Or you could even have some students receiving a homework assignment that would be not useful and impacts their learning. Um, in that case, you can do what's called block randomization, where you can say, okay, maybe rather than having it randomized at the other student level, maybe we'll it randomize it at the level of classes. So at least everyone who's graded on the curve is getting the same assignment. And even then, you have to get informed consent from the teachers. Um, another version of this is not necessarily harm to the customer, but harm to your business. Um, if you think there is a chance that one of your variants could like tank your product, maybe you don't want to roll it out to half of your audience. Um, maybe maybe you want to do some sort of very default test. So these are the three things to keep in mind when deciding whether or not to A/B test. So, now I would like you guys to open your notebook. There are three questions at the top of it. I'd like you all to turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, um, and we're going to talk about three questions. So, now that you know what an test is, how might Amazon use it, how might Netflix use it, and most importantly, how might you use it? Um, so, we're going to take five minutes uh, and have a little conversation. And at the end, I would love to hear if anyone wants to share how they would like to use an test. So we will reconvene, uh, about six minutes, we'll reconvene at 11. Also, there's one precinct up here in front row, but anyone from the back or wants to come and sit in a chair? Or make the wall? Make the wall? That's fine, Tim. I'll take it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I think it would be more like based on time. Okay. Which one was cool. Yeah. Okay, so that'd be really interesting. So, so what you would do? Um, that's a really great, great example. And I actually, I'm gonna run with that and use that in our next, our next sample um, to talk a little bit about. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Anyone else want to share an AB test? Yeah. Um, at GrubHub, we use AB tests to validate or confirm our hypotheses on our search ranking algorithms. Awesome. That is one of the, the key parts, and we're actually going to talk a little bit about algorith uh, different algorithms in the next session. By the way, you guys have been sustaining my family for the past month since we had our review, so appreciate the <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, cool. So we're gonna we're actually going to talk a little bit about both of those examples. Okay, so the next section of this is what do I actually need to run an AB test? So a thing that happens a whole lot to, to data professionals is you start a new job and they say, we've never run an AB test before, but we really want to do it. Tell us how to do it. Um, and the irony is most data scientists know a lot about how to analyze an AB test, but actually uh, a data scientist alone can't set up an AB test usually. But it's helpful to know sort of what you need to ask for to be able to run it. So we're going to cover three things that you need. A framework, metrics, and then some sanity checks to run. The metrics are the thing that we as data professionals are really responsible for. Everything else, we're mostly sort of providing a checklist for other people. And again, that purveyor of common sense. So frameworks. Framework is how we actually show A versus B to different people. In order for our AB test to work, we have to actually have that capability. So one of the easiest ways we can do this is if somehow you already are using a product that has AB test built in as a functionality. Um, so for instance, if you're using the email marketing campaign software like Zapier or MailChimp or any of those other things, a lot of times they'll actually have a setting for AB tests where you can either have two different email subject lines or two different kinds of email tests. And it has everything built in. It'll do the click-through rates for you. Usually it's open rates, and then it can possibly also be click-through rates. Um, also, in-app notification systems. So anything that generates pop-ups, so like I've used uh, app queues or Pendo, those usually have A-B testing settings where you can say, only show this pop-up to half of people. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, now, obviously, this doesn't work for, for everything. So another option, so the classic A-B test is we have some sort of uh, aesthetic change to our website. We have two different layouts or even two different colors for a button. Um, a lot of times if we want to run something like that where we're really talking about change to the HTML and how a page is displayed, there are purchased frameworks that we can use. So these are Google Optimize, Unbounce, Optimize, like basically Google A-B testing framework, and you'll see a whole bunch of them. Now these are expensive. You have to, as a company, choose to pay for them. But you can basically give it your website URL, tell it what you want changed in the HTML. Usually it's pretty easy to set up, and you don't have to you know, devote a whole engineering team to working on it. Now, the final thing is if you want to test something in a custom way. So this is either tends to be the case if you have something very specific you want to do in terms of targeting, or if you're testing an algorithm, like Grubhub. In this case, you're not probably not going to be able to use third-party software. You actually have to build something in-house. This is hard. This you're going to have to devote an engineering team for a quarter to actually build an A-B test framework. You probably don't want to do this unless you plan on doing a lot of A-B testing. Um, but the sort of flip side is if, if you do devote that energy, you have a lot more options. Um, so one thing that we'll cover a little bit later, well, really we'll cover it, and then I'll say three sentences on it, is Bayesian A-B testing. That only works generally if you have your own framework set up. Now the other reason that this can be really helpful is targeting. So for instance, if you don't want to just completely randomly assign people to groups, if you want to say something like, I want only want to A-B test on users with this set of parameters, you might have to have a custom framework. Okay, so once we have a way of displaying A and B, now we actually need something to measure. So if we go back to that little chart that I made here, uh, we need a y-axis. We need some way of saying which is better, A or B. Um, cool. 
So things to consider when choosing a metric. Your metric has to be measurable with your framework. So for instance, if you decided that you're using an email marketing platform, it's probably not going to be easy for you to measure things like dollar amount that people purchase on your website because that's going to be logged in a completely different um, system than your email marketing and software. So you have to have <coughs> sort of a match up that way. Um, then these other two are sort of two competing things. On the one hand, whatever metric you choose has to be directly related to your feature. So in a lot of cases, um, does anyone know what NPS is? Net Promoter Score? Yeah, can you give us a definition? Um, it's like number of people who like your thing by this number of people who just like your thing. Yeah, it's basically, it is an empirically validated way of saying how popular your product is. It's a little pop-up question that says, how likely are you to refer this product to a friend? And then a scale from, from 1 to 10. And there's a special way of measuring it. It's we use it because it's very common across the industry, and you can find NPS values for different industries and be able to say, like, okay, I'm roughly in line with, with my competitors. Um, but anyway, NPS is a very, very generic metric. So it's probably not a good metric to, to pair with changing the color of a button. Right? We don't really expect those two things to be related, and it's much more likely that if you see a difference in NPS that there's some other confounding factor. Now, on the other hand, we have the consideration that we want a metric that's actually important to our business. So, for instance, um, it's probably pretty easy to measure the amount of time that people spend hovering over buttons of different colors, but it's not clear that that actually matters to us. So, we're always trying to balance those two things. We want a metric that's relevant uh, to the business, but also relevant to whatever it is that we're testing. So, common metrics that people use click through rate is by far the most common, it's just the percentage of people who click on an email or a link or a button. Um, dollar amount purchased um, can be another one. Email open rate, um, feature usage rate. And then satisfaction can be something. So um, a gentleman at the back, actually, uh, what's your name, sir, who came up and talked? Hi. Um, so he shared with us the idea that a survey can be a metric. So you might have some sort of a question that you ask people after they've seen two different versions of your product or your website, and that can be your metric, how people respond to that question. Okay, so finally, um, there are a set of sanity checks that, again, isn't strictly your job as a data scientist to, to carry out, but it's good to have at the back of your head. Um, and these are all real problems I've seen with, with AB tests. So number one, Make sure your A-B test is actually showing both A and B. I've actually seen this happen where one piece of code overwrote another piece of code and only the A metric ever showed. Um, you also want to check and make sure that you get the correct split. So if you're expecting a 50-50 split, split of A and B, but that's actually what's showing up. Or alternatively, if you're expecting 90% A, 10% B, because that's what's actually showing up. Um, the way I usually accomplish this is before the test starts, make sure that if I you know, open up some incognito windows that I'm seeing both variants eventually. And then once the test starts, I have some sort of a dashboard that I can refresh and be checking and that just counts how many people saw A and how many people saw B. Another thing I want to check is can the same person see multiple variants and is that going to be a problem for this experiment? So the classic example of where this is really bad is suppose you're testing, you're doing a pricing test, and some people are going to see a 10% discount, and some people are going to see a 20% discount. People are going to be kind of upset if on two different days they see two different prices. Um, I think the classic example is people get really, really mad when they see the airline prices change. Um, in other cases, again, in the case of like the button color, it might not really matter if the same person can see different uh, buttons on different days. So there's a couple ways we can control for this. Um, one thing is we can make sure that the same IP address always sees the same variant. Um, the problem with that is if you think that people might be visiting both on their laptop and on their phone, um, those would be two different IP addresses, that could be a problem. Um, another way people control for this is if your product has some sort of login, 
only assigning the variants and, and displaying them after people are logged in so that we can make sure that the same identity always sees the same thing. Um, and then finally, you can make randomness appear to be sort of part of the game. So a really common example of that is if you've ever gone to a website and it says like, you know, spin the wheel to see what discount you get, that can be used to run an AP test because that way it's expected that you might see two different things, so that you and your friend might see different things, and no one would be upset about that. Um, another thing that's really important is to make sure that you're actually collecting the data that you need to calculate your metric. So that both means collecting the, the actual metric itself, it also means knowing if someone saw the A variant or the B variant. So that tends to be a problem when you have one system that's running the A-B test and deciding who sees A and B, and a different system that's collecting the metric, and you don't have a common key to join them. So you don't have like a user ID that's the same between both systems. So that's really important. You want to make sure that you can track both of those things. And then finally, it's good to have a single person who is sort of in charge of monitoring. That could be you, or that could be like a product manager or someone. But there should be some sort of dashboard and someone whose job is to refresh it and check on it. Um, Real story, I actually had a product manager who was supposed to be in charge go on vacation the week that we launched the AB test. Um, and we didn't realize until like halfway through that it was broken and wasn't actually running. Um, so that's, that's bad. So some, someone should be in charge, someone, and in particular, if there's any reason why you might want to stop the AB test early. So for instance, if you're doing a pricing test and it becomes clear that way more people are buying at a super low price point and that's going to hurt your bottom line as a company, you want to be able to stop it. Um, or in the case of uh, you know, two algorithms, one algorithm like really, really badly performed, you want to be able to turn it on. Okay, so now we're going to go to our notebook and there are three examples, three data sets, and each one of them has a problem. So each one of these is a possible result of an AE test, and there's something missing. So, may I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? This is the building fire alert selector. We have received an alarm from the seller, and we are making investigations. Please verify for further information. I'm going to assume the building is not on fire and keep going. <laughs> if smoke comes through the doors, we might leave or we might chance it and stay because this is really important information. 15% of us should stay in the All right, so <laughs> folks, I would like you all to start on examples one, two, and three. Uh, it is currently 11.13. At 11.20, we will discuss um, what might be wrong with each one of these examples. Have it. Um, and if you have a question, um, raise your hand and either Nicole and I, or I will come and chat with you about it. And if you're working in the collab notebook, I'm sorry, but the answers are already there. Thank you. 
So originally, I showed you this bar graph, but we're all data people here, so we know that no bar graph is complete without error bars. And in particular, we don't know what the error bars are for this test and whether or not they're overlapping. So for instance, in this case, if the error bars kind of overlap each other, it might not be a real difference. It might just be statistical noise. So what we want to be able to do is distinguish between the real difference between A and B or just a measurement error. So what I want us to do is now switch over to the notebook and we're going to just develop an intuition for what affects our, our results. So bear with me on this. So for example four, I've created a function for you called calc percent correct. So what this function is going to do is you're going to give it a sample size, so that's how many people were shown variant A or variant B, um, and then the real click-through rates for variant A and variant B. So the rates that we would see if we observed infinite people and our sample size was you know, millions and millions. Um, so, and then uh, number of experiments would be how many times we run the A-B test. So, you know, imagine that we could run the A-B test not once, but a thousand times, with all with the same sample size. What this function will then tell us is how many times the directionality of our observation matches the empirical truth. So for instance, um, if we go down here, let's say we have a relatively small sample size, like 500. And let's say that our click-through rate for A is 5% and for B is 6%. So this is the sort of empirical, this is the, the ground truth. If we had an infinite size sample, A would have a 5% click-through rate, B would have a 6% click-through rate, B is better than A. Um, and then let's just pick a really big number for a number of experiments. Let's do 10,000. And so we want to know, of those 10,000 experiments, how often do we actually get that B is better than A if we're only showing 500 people each variant? And it would help if I had first done that. Okay, cool. So, in this case, I only see correct directionality in 74% of the experiments. So this means that when I actually run my AD test, there's only a 3 out of 4 chance that I see the results that is reflects what's actually the ground truth. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I'd like folks to do is play around with these numbers, play around with different sample sizes, different values of A and B, and see what happens. If you scroll down, you'll actually see some uh, matplotlib plots where you fill in either different sample sizes, different control B, or different control A. Um, you can see different, um, you can, you'll get different graphs, and you get a sense of what sorts of values we need to be very confident that we actually will get the result that we expect. And so this is, keep in mind, this is just for us to develop an intuition. This isn't actually how we would run an AB test, but we just want to get a sense of what are the different things that actually affect our accuracy. So let's take until 11.30 to play around with these.
Oh, no, you don't have to divide by. Uh, so the way this code is working is it's a set of binaries and it's taking the mean of ones and zeros. And right. so that end, so so yeah, so it's, it is because it's the mean is divided by. So it's basically because it's np dot mean. It's basically adding up all the ones that were correct and then dividing by the simple size. So I'm going to show some plots. So first thing, uh, this is probably something that, that is pretty intuitive. As our sample size gets bigger, we're more likely to get an accurate result. So, and so what you can see here is that with relatively small sample sizes, like 100 in each group, you're going to be wrong a significant portion of the time. Um, whereas when we get up to big samples like 5,000 or 10,000, we're right a lot more frequently. Um, so this is a really important thing to keep in mind at the sort of planning stages that you're going to be probably relatively large sample sizes and if you don't think you're going to get those, again, an EV test might not be for you. Um, we'll also, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll talk about how to actually calculate the exact sample size that you need in order to get the, the amount of accuracy that you want. So another thing that's important is the difference between the two click-through rates. Again, this should be somewhat intuitive, that the more different A and B variants are, the easier it is to detect, the, the more likely you are to be able to detect any difference that there actually is. So if B is way, 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 way better than A, you're going to need either you just be more accurate or you'll need a smaller sample size. And then finally, this one I think is a little bit unintuitive but really interesting. If your event is very rare, you need a much larger sample size to achieve sensitivity. It's basically much less likely that you'll be sensitive. Um, and this sometimes affects what metric you want to use. So email open rates are very, very low. Um, same thing like ad click through rates are pretty low. Do you happen to know since you do marketing like roughly? What are roughly click through rates that you got? Uh, yeah. What's like a rough? It depends. I mean, it's yeah. hard to say. Like for, for like a, you know, it depends on whether they have a subscription based model or mm -hmm. like a, yeah. Yeah, but like it's not at all uncommon to have less than one percent. Yeah. So if you have those very, very rare events, it's going to be much harder to know if two rarer events are different rates. Um, whereas if you have relatively common events, it's much easier to see the difference. So generally, things that happen once you're on the website are going to be more common and easier to get sensitivity on than things that happen outside of your website. So things that happen either with an ad or an email. Um, so, Deciding sort of where in your funnel you place the metric can really affect your A-B test. It can make it much easier to run. Uh, yeah. So let's just summarize this. So as sample size increases, our sensitivity increases. As the effect size, the difference between A and B increases, our sensitivity increases. And then as the baseline metric, in this case we're going to say click-through rate increases or sensitivity increases. And generally, I think of this as, as effect size increases, the necessary sample size decreases. As baseline CTR increases, the necessary sample size decreases. Okay, so that's all fun. And technically, you could set up some sort of little simulation like this and just keep plugging in values in order to decide if your test is going to be significant or not. But that's not really how we do it. We actually have a more formal framework for this, and it's called hypothesis testing. So the way hypothesis testing works is we start with a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that we assume there is no difference between A and B. 
And then we look at the results of our test and we say, what is the probability given these results that our null hypothesis is true? And if that probability is less than 5%, then we say, ah, it's more likely that the hypothesis is just false and we're able to reject it. And that probability that the null hypothesis is true is called a p-value. Um, so there are lots of different hypothesis tests depending on what kind of data you have. So there, we can have different numbers of variants. So we talked about A-B testing, but you could have A, B, C, D, E, F testing. You can have as many variants as you want. Um, that's one option. And then the more subtle thing is there are two types of metrics we can have. We can have categorical metrics or continuous metrics. Categorical metrics are things where you can phrase it as a yes, no. So clicked or didn't click, purchased or didn't purchase, or different results on a survey, you know, liked or didn't like, promoter or detractor. Continuous is something where there's actually a different number. So for instance, uh, if we wanted to look at dollar amount purchased or amount of time spent on a website, or you know, number of, of likes on a website. Generally, we actually only deal with the categorical data, so that's what I'm going to cover here. But it is worth knowing that if you have continuous data, your options for hypothesis testing are a two-sample t-test, if there's two variants, and if there's multiple variants, you have to use both ANOVA, which tells you whether or not there is a significant difference, and then a two-key range test, which tells you which of the variants are significantly different. And the documentation uh, in, in uh, SciPy for two sample t tests and stats model for ANOVA and Tukey are really good and you'll be able to read those. But it's just very rare that people actually run AB tests on continuous variables. It's much more likely that you, you'll run them on categorical variables. In both cases, you can use chi square. And we're going to learn how to do that. So let's go to our notebook. Okay. So. The way we run an AD test is we start, or sorry, the way we analyze an AD test um, after it's run is we create something called a contingency table. And a contingency table should have, it, the sum of all cells should describe all people who participated in our test. So for instance, uh, this cell describes people who saw variant A and did not click the ad. This cell here describes people who saw variant B and did not click the ad. This cell described people saw variant A did click the ad, and then B and did click the ad. So it's important to remember here is intuitively you might think that row one should be like the whole the total number of people in the test and row two would be the number of people who clicked, and that's not right because we should be mutually exclusive cells. So in this case, what you can see is the total number of people who saw variant A was a thousand, and the total number who saw B was a thousand. So once we have that, from sci-fi.stats, we import chi2 contingency, um, and that's the test we'll be using. And then we fit, we create a numpy array that represents our contingency table. And then all we do is we call chi2 contingency with our table that we've created. And then um, generally, we would want to use correction equals false. Correction is for um, we need to use something called a, a Bonferi, bon, I never know how to pronounce it, Bonferroni correction if we have a very small number in any of these cells, I believe it is less than five. Um, but if you forget to enter that, it doesn't make a really huge difference in your p-value and you're probably fine. Um, so there will be a whole lot of things that come that, that are returned by this function, but all you care about is that key value, which tells you whether or not you can reject your null hypothesis. So we can fill in these values for our contingency table so that it matches here, and then run this next. In this case, our key value is 0.3, so that's saying that there's a 30% chance that our null hypothesis is correct. So we're not able to reject the null hypothesis in this case. So 
Why might that be? Well, if we look here, we have a sample size of 1,000, and we have a click-through rate of 5 and 6%. As we saw from our table before, that's not really enough um, to, to be sure we, that we would get the right answer. But what if our, we kept the proportions the same, but just our sample size was five times larger? So what I'm going to do in this case is just copy this contingency table over, but I'm going to multiply everything by five. So I'm going to say that I somehow was able to get five times as many samples. You can see here, our p-value goes down to 2%. So if I had five times more samples and the same results, I would be able to reject the null hypothesis. So the other thing that is worth knowing um, mostly for if you are doing a job interview and someone asks you what is the correct hypothesis test for an A-B test, um, the proportional z-test will also give you the same answer as the chi-square. Um, and we can just prove that right here really quickly. Um, and you can see we get the exact same answer. This is for the original one um, with a thousand in each group. Um, I think the chi-squared is better because one, you'll notice that it has sort of fewer arguments, it's a little bit easier. And two, the chi-squared can support multiple variants. So if you had A, B, C, D, you could still use the chi-squared. You just make your array bigger. Okay, so that was pretty straightforward. But what do we do when we actually get those results? So in particular, in that first case, what does it actually mean when my AB test isn't significant? So it means that we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, but it doesn't necessarily mean that our null hypothesis is true. There could be a difference, but we're just not able to detect it. Um, now, what's important is that what we are able to say is that if there is a difference, it is smaller than some x. And we're gonna, in the next slide, talk about how to actually know that x. But what's really important, that I cannot say enough, if your A-B test is not significant, that does not mean to just run your test longer and get more samples. Because generally, you should be able to know the level of sensitivity you want, and getting more sensitivity will not necessarily help your business case. Um, the other thing that's also important is as you run more and more A-B tests, selectively continuing the A-B test when you get an answer you don't want, will eventually bias your results. So if you always are running A-B tests until they reach significance, um, that's not a valid statistical technique. So it's important to decide the sample size before you run your test, and then keep that sample size. Now, how do we do that? Conveniently, there are online calculators. So you could play around with that simulation tool that I showed you in the beginning, but why would you do that when there's an online calculator? It's so much easier. So this is a really easy one. It's the Optimizely Sample Size Calculator. And it has a whole bunch of parameters that you'll notice are very different from what we saw in SciPy. So let's talk about what these mean. So the first thing it asks you is a baseline conversion rate. So what that basically means is what do we think the click-through rate for A is? Um, and remember, as we noticed before, as this increases, your necessary sample size decreases. So let's set it at five, like we had before. Minimum detectable effect. This is the most complicated uh, part. This is how sensitive we want our test to be. Am I, did I see the check yet? So while it's being done, I'm actually going to make a shameless plug for a talk we're doing yes. later in the afternoon called Hacking the Data Science Challenge, where we can roll other people about that one. So, as I'm doing A-B testing, but if you're in the interview process, or soon to be, and you want to see common mistakes and have to avoid them in the Data Science Challenge, please come to the talk. It's the last session of the day. I think it's in the room next door. You should absolutely go because my fall is amazing. I am? Yes. <laughs> Very much so. Okay. 
So minimum detectable effect size. This is the difference between A and B that we want to be able to detect for sure. So this is when we were playing around uh, up here. This is basically this. Do we want to be able to detect when they're, when they're far apart or do we want more sensitivity? Do we want to be able to detect a smaller difference between A and B? Now, what does this 20%? It is 20% relative to this 5%. So in this case, this would be uh, 5% versus 6%. Um, and so the way you would do that is 5 times 1.2 to figure out what it, what it is. And then finally, we have statistical significance. So that's just that we want to, what key value are we going to use? So I had said previously, P is 0.05. That's kind of the standard um, that most people use. If this is not a particularly important feature that you're working on, if it's trivial to implement, you might not want to use 0.05. You might want to use 0.1 um, and, and be okay with being less certain of your, of your results. If this is super important and it's going to cost you a billion dollars to do your variance, you probably want something more more certain than 0.05. I'm going to have set this to 99%. Um, but yeah, so we can see, and again here we can see, as we increase the minimum detectable event, our sample size goes down. So what we see here, um, in this case, is if we wanted to tell the difference between 5 and 6, we need uh, a sample size of about 6,900. So you'll notice that we were actually able, in that example, we got significance at 5,000. That's fine. That's because we happen to get the right results in that. This is saying in order to be certain, given that there's going to be all sorts of variants, and we might not actually observe 5% and 6%. Now let's talk a little bit more about that minimum detectable difference. Um, baseline conversion. Okay, let's talk about the baseline conversion. So baseline conversion rate. How do we actually get the baseline conversion rate? So if variant A is your existing property, you're basically saying A is control and then B is something I want to change, it's really easy. You can just use some sort of historical data. Otherwise, you have some options. You can look and see if there's a similar metric in your existing product. So for instance, uh, with the example of the email marketing, maybe this is a totally new email marketing campaign that's out there and you don't have historical data, but you do have other email marketing campaigns you can say, Here's a similar one. It was a 1% click-through rate. I'm going to use 1%. You can also look at industry trends. So again, I'm just going to keep using emails because that's a really common one. You can Google and say, what are typical email open rates for X thing? And you can probably get just a ballpark to start with. And then if all else fails, wild guesses. Um, talk to your product manager, talk to other people at your company, and come up with a number that makes sense. Remember that the smaller your baseline rate is, the, uh, the larger sample size you're going to need. So you want to err on the side of smaller to be sort of certain that you get a big enough sample size. Minimum detectable difference. This one's a pain in the neck. So the best case for being able to pick a really good minimum detectable is when you can tie everything to dollars. So for instance, if you can say, I know that um, you know, variant A is my product as it is. Variant B is some new feature I want to build. I know that to build out the full feature is going to cost this many dollars. Or maybe variant B is some ad that I want to run, and I know that it costs this much money to run the ad. Um, then you can balance that and say, okay, this is the lift I would need to see between A and B to justify that cost. That's kind of your best case scenario is when you can actually put dollars and say, I need exactly this lift. Um, that example that we had where we were talking about price points, that's a great example where you can actually say, this is the minimum detectable uh, effect that I need. So for instance, if you're offering a 20% discount, you need to have a, make at least 20% more sales to make up that much. So you know exactly what your minimum detectable difference can be. Now what about if it's something fuzzier than that? So for instance, with our email, with email marketing campaign, it doesn't cost anything to send two different uh, things. How do we how do we decide what our minimum detectable event is? Um, there's sort of two ways we can do this. One is we can say, what's the smallest difference that I would feel embarrassed reporting to my boss? Like for instance, if I say I ran this whole A B test and it is one percent better, your boss is probably going to look at you like you're a crazy person. The other thing that folks will often do 
is they'll work backwards. They'll say, I know that it's reasonable for me to have 3,000 in each sample size. So what you'll do is you'll kind of click around until you get this to be 3,000, and you'll say, okay, I know that I would be able to detect roughly a 30% difference. Um, and I'm going to be comfortable knowing that when I get my results back, if I can't reject the null hypothesis, that it's still possible that there is a less than 30% difference between the two variants. And if I get it back, it is 30% or greater. Okay, so let's let's try this. So if y'all can navigate to optimizely.com slash sample size calculator, play around with it for a while, get a sense for how it works, um, and how clicking the different buttons changes things. And we're gonna do that, yeah, we're gonna do that for, let's get give it three minutes. Yes. Oh, that's a really good point though. Can you make, would you like to do that? Okay. Really good point. Notice that this is per variation. So if it says 3,000, that means you need double that. And that's if you're doing a 50-50 split. If you're doing a 90-10 split, this is the smaller sample size. So you would actually need 10 times as many. That's a really important point. And it's like triple on and three that Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yes? Is there a rule of thumb as to what the time interval uh, that you're doing these 80 tests over? That is an excellent question. Time intervals. So there is no rule of thumb. Theoretically, your A-B test could run for an infinite length. However, the longer you run it, the more other variables are going to creep in. So the classic example of this is suppose you're running an A-B test and you find out that your, you know, some other department in your company is, is making some big change to the website. That's probably not good to have that happen in the middle of your A-B test because you've now changed the conditions. Or someone else is running a sale and sends out a huge email blast of them. That's also not good. So generally, you want to try to get your A-B tests done you know, within a couple of weeks. But what's even more important <coughs> is that everyone in your company knows that you're running the A-B test and knows that they should at least talk to you before doing something big. So that's where we go back to those sanity checks, where it's really important to have someone who's in charge of the A-B test who can do that coordination across the company. Okay, so does everyone feel pretty good with using the Optimizely side? Makes pretty good sense? All right. So the final thing that I wanted to touch on, and then we'll do questions, is how many of y'all were in the talk before this on statistics? Yeah? And you guys all heard a lot about Bayesian statistics, right? Yeah? Okay. This whole thing that we're doing is frequentist. And you guys all probably heard that frequentist is bad. Bayesian is good. So why are we doing a frequentist then? So the main reason is that Bayesian only makes sense if we have a strong prior. And the whole point of our AD test is that we don't have a prior. We don't know any information about which of these variants are, are better. That's why we're running an AD test. Now, there is a Bayesian version of an AD test, and it has to do with that timing issue. So if you have a very specific situation where you know that you have sort of an infinite pool of sample sizes. Uh, so you, you, there's no sort of, oh, I only have this many people I want to show to. There's actually just your whole customer base forever. You're never going to have trouble getting enough. Um, and you really need to get to the right answer as quickly as possible. Then you actually have a Bayesian situation because you can update your prior as you go. Um, and it's called a multi-armed bandit approach. The reason it's called a multi-armed bandit is that you know the like slot machines in a casino? Those are called one-armed bandits, apparently, I have been told. And the imaginary situation where people came up with the statistics for this is suppose you have a whole bunch of slot machines and you know that one of them has a better payout than the others, 
you would want to, the, the situation is you want to be trying all the machines to try to find out which one has the best payout. But as quickly as possible, you want to stop pulling the machines that don't have good payouts and only pull the one that has good payouts. Um, so what you're able to, to do is, in a Bayesian sense, as you pull each time and get a result, either yes you won or no you didn't, you update your prior, and that will let you zero in on the correct answer much faster. So in order to run multi-armed bandit, you have to have a special AB test setup, probably a custom one that you built yourself. That probably only makes sense if you're going to be running a lot of these. So for instance, BuzzFeed is obviously going to have a multi-armed bandit setup because they want to very quickly zero in on the correct title for each, um, for, for each of their articles. Whereas for most people, that's just a lot less important because they're, you know, Generally, actually, most places I've worked for have a limited number of, a limited sample size of their work, but they don't have the really big sample size that you would need for a multi-armed bandit. Um, it's usually much more a case of like, well, we're going to run this for a week and see what results we get. Um, and then the, the other issue is just that you have to, it's a big investment to set up this uh, system. So, yeah, so minimize. So, um, that is the end of my prepared material. Yes, and I would like to take questions. On, on bandit testing, mm -hmm. would you agree that it makes sense to use it maybe if you're very loss averse? <laughs> if you're very what? Sorry? If you're very loss averse. <laughs> Sorry, there was sneezing. One more time. <laughs> loss averse. Loss averse. Yes. Um, I would say. Oh, oh good. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. When should you use multi-armed bandit? Does it make sense if you're very loss averse? Yes. If you think there's a very high cost to having the wrong answer, then a multi-armed bandit is a great approach. Um, so for instance, pricing makes a lot of sense um, to do that. If you, know, you don't want to offer something for too cheap. Cool. Other questions? Yes. Talk about categorical versus uh, continuous. So, how frequently are you to recommend to a friend one through ten, one is no way, or how ten is absolutely yes? Do they tend to do that as a continuous, or do we tend to bin it as heck yes, heck no, that? That is a great question. So the question was uh, for an NPS type question where we say on a scale of one to ten, how likely are you to recommend this product? Do you treat it as continuous or as uh, bins? So for NPS specifically, we tend to analyze it as bins at, so the, the standard NPS score is a 9 and a 10 is a promoter, a 7 or an 8 is a neutral, and a 1 through 6 is a detractor, um, and that the net promoter score is defined as the promoters, the percent promoters minus percent detractors. What I have generally done is do it as three bins um, and, and treat it as continuous. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, as, as two bits and treat it uh, as, or sorry, as that as categorical. There we go. Um, you, but if you just happen to have a ten point scale and it wasn't NPS specifically, and you thought that your distribution was going, so the other thing about NPS is it really tends to be a very bimodal distribution. That's why it's analyzed that way. Is people tend to either say ten or zero. Um, they tend not to say a lot of things in the, in the middle. If you have something that's a smoother distribution like that, so for instance, if you have a five-point Likert-like scale for an agree-disagree with a statement, then it might make more sense to treat it as continuous and to treat it as, as that you're looking at the average. Um, a rule of thumb you can use is, will you be reporting a percent or will you be reporting an average for that question? So, Generally, for NPS, we report 100%. We're saying this, this percent of people are promoters, or this percent of people are detractors. Whereas for a five point Likert scale, um, it's relatively common to report an average to say, you know, people on average are a 3.7 on this question. Any other questions? Yeah? Is it more um, actual uh, you know, a setting where you have? demonstrable times. Mm -hmm. um, often the question becomes how long do you run it for, right? And I think you kind of address that with 
you rephrase that as a sample-sized question mm -hmm. by wanting to ask you in our own experience. Would you apply it? What would you advise yeah. to the cloud cloud? That's a good question. So when you say clients, is it like your your A B testing? Oh, because you're your email marketing, so it's like which thing? Yeah. So so the question was generally how do we think about link for these? Um, what I would say is always go back to what is the decision you're trying to make. Um, so if the so if the decision you're trying to make is which ad should I run? Um, and you have some sense of sort of how important this is, you can get a sense of like, is this something where it's more important to have a fast answer that's less accurate? Or is this something where it's like a really important ad campaign and we're willing to put time and to wait? Um, if you just want to run it quickly, what I would say is do that sort of backward sample size thing where uh, rather, Rather than saying, what sample size do I need? Say, this is the sample size I think I can get in the time frame that you're interested in. And then report back, this is the effect that I will be able to, to detect. And again, a lot of times you can sort of phrase that as a dollar, into a dollar of some sort. You can say like, okay, I, I would be able to detect if this ad is 20% bad better. We know that of people who click on the ad, this percent will make a purchase of purchases of approximately this dollars. You can put it into terms of dollars. Um, and what will oftentimes happen is you'll share, or in my experience, is you'll share that with a client or a client team internally, and they'll say, yeah, that's fine. Or they'll say, oh, wow, I actually want to be able to detect something smaller than that. I'm willing to give you more time to run this. Um, but yeah, a lot, my my experience generally has been that people are more sensitive <coughs> to the time than to the sensitivity. They'd rather have a less precise answer in a shorter time than a more precise answer. Um, and it's really important to, I think, to try and put it in dollar values because the other experience I've had is that a lot of times the person who's asking you to run the test is violating that first rule of baby testing that they really aren't trying to make a decision, they're really just trying to prove that their yeah, variant is fun. better. And so they'll start out by saying things like, well, I want to be able to detect any difference because I want to be able to tell my boss how much better my variant is than the original one. And you'll go through and be like, okay, well, in that case, you need, you know, 60,000 people. And then they'll say, oh, I don't really want that. And then you're sort of back to saying, like, okay. And then, then you sort of can walk them back to a realistic number. Um, I really do like the phrasing of what is the difference that you can report to your boss and not feel stupid. Because yeah. um, that does tend to get people to stop thinking of it in terms of, like, I want to be able to check any possible difference. I want to run the test as long as possible because I want to prove that I'm right. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. In your opinion, like, is it worth it to run an A-B test if you know that your sample size will be like very low, like maybe less than 200? No, it's not worth it. Um, what I would say in that case, so there's a couple things. Um, if it's really small and you're able to, I would actually say that qualitative feedback is more helpful. So um, either read a couple books on how to run uh, focus groups and run your own, or hire a UX researcher. Um, I found that focus groups can actually be extremely helpful. Um, another thing, if it's like an aesthetic change to the website, uh, recording people's sessions and seeing where they click can be really helpful. Um, but also, yeah, just talking to people, um, running interviews uh, it is better if you're going to have that small of a sample size. Uh, okay. Anything else? Uh, the simulation, so the thing that I ran at the beginning where we have that little function, that simulation, that's mostly just for you to develop an intuition about things. Generally, you should use the hypothesis testing. Um, but the sim if you ever sort of feel like, uh, I, I feel like I'm running this hypothesis test where all my results don't make sense, that simulation is a good way to sort of rebuild your intuition and make sure that you understand how things are working. <coughs>